Good morning, Valley Life. Today we'll be reading from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. If you need a Bible to follow along or would like a Bible in your home, please raise your hand. We have Usher coming down the aisle. They would be happy to give you one. Please feel free to take it home as our gift to you. If you grabbed a black Bible on your way in or from the ushers, our scripture today can be found on page uh, 924. Please follow along with me. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just lift up Pastor Matthew to you, Lord. We ask that you would give him the words to speak, Lord, that you would um, prepare our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your word this morning, and that we would leave here differently than we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, you may have a seat. I'm excited for this morning. Uh, Of all the weeks of the First Things First sermon series, and to remind you, the First Things First sermon series, what we've done is we said, hey, as we start off another year, you know, we just celebrated our uh, uh, another birthday in our church, and uh, and we just said, hey, let's get back to the basics. Let's go back to the beginning and ask ourselves some foundational questions that we can make sure that as a church we have the answers to. So we started with, what is the gospel? And we talked a lot about that, but we said we're going to sum it up for a good answer. We said, Jesus, in my place for my sins. And I really wanted you to grab a hold of that and remember that. And then we, then we started asking the question, well, what does a Christian do? And we said, well, a Christian loves God and loves others. And we said the way that we really pursue loving God and loving others is through prayer, Bible, church, and mission. We said that we spend time in the ear of God. We spend time in the Word of God. We spend time in the people of God, in the mission of God. We want to spend time in those things, and that's what we covered last week. And then today we get to ask the question, what should a Christian think of themselves? How should a Christian see themselves? Maybe how should a Christian perceive of themselves? Um, What do they do with this identity? Because there's a real way that Christians can go to too far of the spectrum. If we think too highly of ourselves, we could fall into this trap of like moralism or uh, overly legalistic, and we, we really just look down on other people and Uh, attack their sins while not really ever reconciling our own. That's one extreme. Or there's this other extreme that like we've humbled ourselves so point that we've self-deprecated, that we think so little of ourselves, or we try to beat ourselves down and say, no, I've got to stay humble, I've got to stay lowly. And both of those are the far ends of the spectrum when what we really want is something in the middle. So, so far every week that we've asked a question, I've kind of waited to the end, right? Like I pull the string real tight and at the end I snap and, and I give it to you. But I want to lead with it this week. Because as we go through the text today, I want you to see this, because this phrase matters in your life. So how should a Christian see themselves? In Christ. In Christ. That's how I want you to see yourself, is in Christ. And we're going to talk a lot about what that means today, but in this section of Colossians chapter 1, you're going to see the phrase, in Him, in Christ, a bunch. And so this is a good week. You know, a lot of weeks I jump all over the Bible. I love the Bible Uh, I love just making sure that we prove the Bible through lots of sections, but today I'm pretty much going to stay right here in Colossians 1. So this is a good week where if you want to pull out your Bible, your e-Bible, your physical Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be spending all our time there today. So what should a Christian think of themselves? They should think of themselves as in Christ. And it starts off, I'm going to back up from where Tracy read, and I'm going to go all the way back to verse 1. And Paul is writing this letter to the church in Colossae, and it's a, it's a pl- church that he planted, and he's writing to them, and he starts off like this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, so that's who's writing this, to the saints and faithful brothers that, in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So he said, okay, it's Paul's the author, he's writing to the church in Colossae, specifically he's writing to the saints. This is where we get to rest with the uncomfortable fact that Uh, that we are all saints. If you've repented of your sins, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. 
So I want you to rest in that feeling for a second. So I could look out and go, oh, we got St. Linda here. We got St. Mike, St. Nello, St. Ford. We got a lot of saints out here. St. James, I see you. Hey, listen, that's kind of weird, right? We would, it's kind of weird if we went around greeting each other. We're like, mm, brother saint, good to see you. That'd be weird. But that is true in Christ. Our identity has totally been changed. We are saints and the faithful brothers of the church Colossae. That's who Paul is writing to. But then he's going to go in, and he's going to describe. Paul's going to kind of say, hey, I thank God for you, and I thank God for you because of these reasons. And, and as Paul goes through these reasons, he's really kind of describing what the member of the church at Colossae would be like, the kind of person they are. And so in our first section here, I want us to see this big idea, that in Christ, you may have more than you realize. That in Christ, that's our big idea for the day, in Christ, you may have more than you realize. See, because when I say that a Christian should see themselves in Christ, that could mean a lot of things. If we went around the room today, and I said, hey, the fact that you are in Christ, what does that mean to you? We would probably get like 50 different answers, and that would probably be fine. But I want you to really look at this. As Paul thanks God for the church, I want you to look at the profile of that church member here. So Paul starts in verse 3. We thank God, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and, the, and of the love that you have for all the saints. So Paul says, listen, when I, th- when I pray for the church at Colossae, and listen, I like praying for our church, so when I pray for the church here in North Peoria, Paul says he thinks that it's worth thanking God for their faith in Christ Jesus. That they have the kind of faith that when they see it, is worth thanking God for. To say, man, I thank God that you guys have the faith you do. And he says, and for the love that you have for all the saints. Paul says, the way that y'all love each other, man, I thank God for that. I thank God for the way you love each other. Goes on in verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Paul says, I thank God for you because you have this hope that's been given to you that you have this hope that you trust in. And God, I just thank you that you have that hope. Then he goes on to say in verse 6, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Paul says, man, when I look out, there's fruit in your life. And I just thank God for the fruit that is bearing in your life, that you're growing in peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. I just, man, I'm I thank God that you're those kind of people. You're a gentle people, a patient people, a loving people. Thank you for all that fruit in your life. And he said, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, in verse 7, he is our faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Paul says, not only do you have all these things I'm thanking you for, but man, in the Spirit of God, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, you just love. You love deeply, not because of anything in you, but because of the Holy Spirit in you. Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. And Paul says, man, I see that because of the Spirit in you. I just see you all loving the crap out of people. I don't know if you can say that, but I did. (laughs) And so Paul says in verse 9, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Asking, and he's going to go on to ask for something else. He says, listen, I, I thank God for all that stuff, and then I want this for you. And because you're all of this, all those things he just said, I want these things from you. He says, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul thinks that the church in Colossae, the members of the church in Colossae, have an ability to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. He says, man, you have the ability to grow like that. Because you are these things, you have an ability to grow in these things, and he wants that for you. And then verse 10, he says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Paul says, listen, I think there's a real way where you could walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. There's a way where you could grow to be fully pleasing to him, where you could bear fruit in every good work, where you could increase in the knowledge of God. You could be strengthened with all his power And you would have the ability to endure whatever life throws at you with patience and joy. Paul says, I I want that for you. I pray that for you, that you could just endure with patience and joy, growing strong in the Lord. And in verse 12, he kind of ends his prayer saying, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in this inheritance of the saints in light. 
Paul says, this is, I, I thank God that you are these things, and I want these things for you. And then he says, and I thank God that you are qualified to get this inheritance. And so I wonder, if you were listening to the qualifications or all the things that he was thanking the members for, or thanking God for, that the members have, I wonder if you, you were feeling like, man, I'm glad that the church at Colossae was like this, but I'm not really quite like that. If we were to back up, we go, man, I, do people look at me and they see my faith in Jesus Christ? And they go, man, I thank God for the faith in Jesus Christ that they have. Do people look at me and go, man, I thank God for the love that they have for other people. They, I thank God for the hope in their life, the fruit in their life, the love that they have in the Spirit. Do people look at me and go, man, that is a person who can grow strong in the Lord. That's a person who's patient and joyful in the middle of adversity. Do we feel like that's us? Maybe, maybe you do. Maybe you totally feel like that's you. But I think that sometimes as we look at the portrait of the church member and we, we realize like all the qualities that we see in the church of Colossae, I wonder if that feels uncomfortable for you. Because man, I, phew, I, I don't have those qualities. It's not all of them. Maybe I'm two for eight. And, and you might be thinking, you know, bro, that, I, I'm, I'm kind of growing there now, but that hasn't always been me. Maybe some of you can look back on a time in your life where if you would have heard all those things, you would have been like, man, that's not me. That's not who I am. Or maybe there's some of you sitting here right now who go, yeah, bro, that's not me. If I were to say those things of you, maybe you would say something to the effect of, I don't think you really understand who I am or what I've done or what I do currently. You might say, I don't think you understand. Like, yeah, I've totally repented of my sins. I put my faith in Jesus Christ, but I don't think you know me and the things I go through. And I'd say, if that's what you're thinking, if you find yourself sitting in a seat right now going, Matthew, I just don't think you know what I've, what I've done. I don't think you really know me. I want to say this. I don't think you really understand who Jesus is or what he's done for you. If you would say, hey, those things aren't true of me, I would say, then I don't think you know my Jesus. I don't think you would understand what he's done for you. Because that leads me to my next point, which Jesus may be more than you realize. If you're sitting there wondering, man, I feel kind of awful. Matthew listed off all these great things about the church members in Colossae, and I just don't feel like that's me. Gosh, I'm such a failure. Gosh, I, I just have fallen so short. Or maybe you come in here feeling guilty, like this is my first time in a couple weeks I've been to church. I just feel awful. You, you came in here with some guilt or shame. I want you to realize that Jesus is more than you could realize. You may need to take a closer look at Jesus and what he has done. Because when we talk about Jesus and, and we say the thing that he has done is just died on the cross for our sins, well, I, I just feel like that cuts a little short to all that Jesus has done. And if we look at who Jesus is, to just simply say he is the Son of God or the Savior, just, man, that robs him of all that he is. And so today, in this section that Tracy just read, I want us to spend a little time looking at who Jesus is. Because if we are in him, if as Christians who have repented of our sins and put our faith in Jesus, if we are in Christ, it ought, we ought to know what in Christ looks like. Who is Christ? What is so great about him? If we say we live in Arizona, we ought to know kind of what that looks like. Though today was confusing. You thought you lived in the desert and you woke up to frost. You're like, hmm, did I move? So I want us to look at this next section, 13 through 20. I want us to look at who Jesus is. It says in verse 13, this is what he's done. He says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. He's delivered, like an Amazon delivery. I like to say it like this, to and from matter in this sentence. The words to and from. When you're saved from something, that means you're saved to something else. A good example I like to give is if you were stuck in a house fire, and in all my strength and bravery, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go in and I'm going to get you out of that house fire. I would try, y'all. I would really try, but don't, don't call me if there's a fire. Call the fire department. Uh, but if your house is on fire, and you needed saving, I, and I went in and I rescued you, you would be saved from fire to safety. Do we understand that? You'd be saved from fire that's ablaze to something that's not ablaze. Okay, so when we talk about to and from, it matters. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. That's where we were to, and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. When we get saved, when we hear that word in the Bible that says saved, we are saved from wrath. We are saved from hell to the kingdom of his beloved son. It's not just that we're spared but we are taken from one place to another. We are delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. He's done that. He's the best Amazon delivery guy ever. He's delivered us from hell to 
his kingdom. Verse 14, it's in him whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know, this one we probably got. When we think about what Jesus has done, we totally think about the forgiveness of sins. Our sins are totally forgiven. But that word redemption matters. We, that's not a word we use a whole lot. But to be redeemed, to have redemption, means that you are restored. That means you are not the sum of all your successes and failures, but rather you are held up in status with Christ. That he is, And in him, you have been redeemed to the point of you are no longer an enemy with the Lord, but rather you are a child of God. We have redemption. He is the great redeemer. And you might think, but how? <laughs> That's great. I- I'm with you, Matthew. This sounds wonderful, and I want that. But how does this practically work? How could Jesus do that? Well, to understand what he's done, we need to look at who he is. In verse 15, it says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. To really understand what Jesus has done and to really look at who he is, we have to start with the fact that Jesus is God. He is God in human form. Jesus, when we, people saw Jesus, it was the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus was there at the beginning. It's going, going to go on to say in verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. I like to point out, this is just interesting. It's not part of my sermon. But that means that there are things that are invisible that he created. I just want you to remember, there are things that are invisible that he created. It says right here. So he created everything in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things. Some things? No. All things were created through him and for him. This says Jesus wasn't only just present at creation. The beginning of John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God and was with God. He was not only there at creation, it said it was created through him and for him. So I want you to know that this is important because you were created through Jesus, and you were created for Jesus. You were created for Him. And it says in verse 17, and He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. If you've ever studied science of any degree, uh, I think I've read somewhere, I'm going to make this up on the spot, but uh, if you, like, you tilted the earth like even like two degrees, that the whole world would like fall apart. That like, it would just not work anymore. I'm not really sure what would happen. I'm not a scientist. I'm a preacher. But it would be bad. It wouldn't work. Or if you've ever studied the human life, do you know that if you are short in just like one vitamin or certain things, or if you're short in one chemical aspect of your body, like it throws everything off, you'll be really sick. Do you know that you have fluid in your ears that if it gets off balance, you'll just become nauseous? That's real. If, and Jesus holds all of this stuff together. You're like, man, how does the world revolve around the sun yet spinning unless you're a flat earther? And then I guess I don't know that it moves. But anyway, But there's a real way that Jesus is holding all of this together. It says he is in control. He holds all things together. So how is it that babies go from just a little egg and grow into a baby, and then they're born, and they grow up? Jesus holds all things all together. How is it that we revolve around the sun and the solar system? Well, he holds all things together. He is in control. And in verse 18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. This is important because it says Jesus is the head of the church. Anyone who is in Christ is a part of the church. When we talk about that to and from, we're actually saved from sin and from wrath and saved to the church, to the body of Christ, which is called the church. We are saved to the, local, or to the church. And he is the head of the church. We follow him, much like a wife submits to her husband, so we as a church submit to Jesus Christ and we follow him He is as the head of the church. But then it goes on to say that he is the beginning and the end. It says all things started through Jesus, but then it says he's the firstborn of the dead. So I want you to think about that. All things started through Jesus and all things in death must be filtered through Jesus. Whether you are a Christian or not, when you die, you will stand before Jesus and he will either say, nope, that is, that is my... I've covered them with my blood. They are with me. Or they will say, I never knew you. And, and then, then he separates it. He says he separates them like the wheat from the chaff. But all things in death must be filtered through Jesus because he is the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. means supreme. That he has the ultimate authority in all things. That he would surpass everything else. That Jesus has the final say in all things. 
He's the only one to ever raise himself from the grave. Now, there's totally people in the Bible who, uh, who were dead and then resurrected, but Jesus is the only one who did it himself. And in verse 19, it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So not only was Jesus fully God, but it pleased God to be with Jesus and in Jesus. When, one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible was when Jesus got baptized and God decided, you know what, let me rip open heaven real quick to make an announcement. He rips open heaven and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. That's important. And it is important because God was pleased with Jesus. And if we really believe that we're in Christ, when we have repented of our sins and put our faith in Jesus Christ, well, what does that mean for us? If I'm in Christ, and Christ is his beloved son with whom he is well pleased, there are some implications there. That means that when we are in Christ, that we are loved by God, and that we are pleasing to him, though not in ourselves, but because we are in Christ. And in verse 20, it says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross reconciliation. When we start thinking about that word, I I think of like interpersonal conflict. That if you and I got beef, we got to work on that. We're going to be reconciled. We're going to have to work through that. But the interesting thing is that when Jesus reconciles us, it's different. Because we don't have any beef with Jesus. You may claim that you do, but you actually don't have anything against Jesus. He's done every part of his end of the relationship. But in our sin, in our disobedience, we betrayed him. So where did all the wrong in the relationship? Yet Jesus, it says, reconciled to himself. He said, no, I want to make this right. I don't want to have animosity in our relationship. So Jesus comes and lives a perfect life, dies a perfect death, and pays the price on the cross for our sins so that the relationship could be restored. So we could be reconciled together. To have peace. Isn't that what the real goal of reconciliation is? Is that we would have peace. That there wouldn't be animosity that there wouldn't be tension, there wouldn't be war. But in our, in our hearts, we naturally feel that tension between us and God. It doesn't feel like there's peace between us and God and when we're lost in the middle of our sin. That feels heavy. But Jesus gives us peace. And we know that in our sin, God and man have a broken relationship. We are naturally enemies to God and we're the ones who are totally at fault. But Jesus makes peace by the blood of the cross. That there is a way through Jesus, because of his perfect life, perfect death, and resurrection, that we can now have peace before God. And here's the thing. Some of you, in my previous hypothesis, were saying, hey, I, Matthew, I don't think you know all the things that I've done. I don't think you know all the things that I'm doing. I don't think you know where I came from. I want to point out, it says, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. All things can be reconciled. That means no matter what you've gone through, no matter what sins you've committed, no matter what walk of life that you've come from, all things are reconcilable through Christ Jesus. And not only is he reconciling, he's reconciling to himself. He wants to create for himself a people, a church. So what do we do with all this then? If, if that's, we have all these things in Christ, there's probably more to that. And if Jesus is more than we ever imagined, what do we do with that? When I say, how does a Christian perceive of themselves, and I tell you the answer is in Christ, what does that mean for us right now? What does that that mean for us right here on January 22nd, 2023? Well, here's my next point. Your reality may be better than you ever realized. Your reality may be better than you ever realized. Verse 21 through 23 is probably some of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. And I want this to be important to you as you think about how am I going to reconcile the fact that I'm in Christ Verse 21 says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. Recognize this is our status before God. Apart from Jesus Christ, this is who we are. We are alienated from him. We are hostile in mind and we do evil deeds. When you think about the word alienated, I don't, I don't mean like aliens from Mars. What I mean is that you do not belong. That we do not belong in the kingdom of heaven. That we do not belong in the presence of God because of our sin and brokenness. We are alienated. We are hostile in mind. What that really means is that we are at war with God in our mind. Our war, we're at war because of our passions within us and the things of God that are at attention. We feel that in our mind. And he says doing evil deeds. Those are sins. And before Christ, there's like a kind of a crazy cycle that maybe our sins cause us to alienate ourselves from God, which causes us to be more hostile in mind, which causes us to do more evil deeds. 
or however you enter into that cycle, it ends up being this, this circle that we get stuck in, stuck in this cycle of hostility, evil deeds, and alienation where we're just pushing ourselves away from God. And we would be stuck there. But my two favorite words I like to tell myself in my devotion time are, but Jesus. Alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, but Jesus. In the beginning of verse 22, it says, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. I want to stop right there for a second. But Jesus. You were totally alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, but Jesus sacrificed himself to disrupt that cycle. That all those things that we talked about, all those authority that Jesus has, the fact that he holds all things together, the fact that he's all-powerful, the thing that all death, all, all those who die will filter through Jesus, that Jesus was the firstborn, the fact that he was there in creation. He gave up all that power, all that position, all that status to die a real death. I need you to understand the death on the cross was not just a simple thing like, cool, 20 minutes and we'll get this over with. It wasn't like that. The death on a cross is literally like drowning. You're suffocating. It's an agonizing death. And Jesus willingly died that death for you. And you might think, well, why would he do that? Why on earth would he do that? Well, the second half of verse 22 tells us, in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. This is your reality. If you are in Christ, if you've repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, this is your reality. That today you stand before Christ holy, blameless, and above reproach. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. Holy, that means as Christ is holy, you are holy before Him. As Christ is blameless, you are blameless, and you are above reproach. That means no one can bring anything to God against you that would condemn you. There's not a thing. So that doesn't mean that your past can come in and go, well, remember when you did that thing? Nope, you are above reproach. Jesus paid for that. When I think about the opposite of being alienated, I think of this, you belong. You belong in the kingdom of God. You belong in his house. You belong at his table. You are no longer at war with God in your heart or your mind. You have the ability to repent of your sins and not be stuck in the cycle of sinful habits. Church, you are absolutely everything that God says you are, and you have absolutely everything that God says you have. So when God declares that you are holy, blameless, and above reproach, understand that he has the ultimate say on that. You are exactly who God says you are, and you are nothing but what God says you are. And you have absolutely everything that God says you have and nothing that he says you don't have. That means if you have guilt and shame, he didn't give that to you. He gave you forgiveness. He gave you his righteousness. You might be thinking, that's great. What's the catch? Verse 23 ends by saying, if, you, if indeed you continue in the faith, Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. In Christ, we respond through faith to remain stable, steadfast, and full of hope. It's not really conditional. When Paul uses the phrase, if, he's not really saying, like, hey, you can have all of that as long as you do this. That's not true. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. But he says, but listen, in light of that, this is how you live. I've said before that in Christ we have a new identity, and that identity should provide us a new way to live, that we should be able to be stable, steadfast, and full of hope. Here's what I really want for you. If I could describe it in an analogy, I want you to have some buoyancy in, your, in the waves of life. That the, the waves of life come crashing, whether that's adversity or sickness or death or tragedy, whatever it is, the waves of life start coming, but I want you to have a buoyancy about you because you are in Christ. What I mean by buoyancy is imagine like a little buoy. You're in the buoy. The buoy is Christ, I guess. And that when the waves of life start coming, that doesn't mean you're not going to get wet. It doesn't mean you're not going to get tossed around. It doesn't mean that you're not going to become nauseous or it's going to be hard or that you're not going to be scared. But what it means is that you're not going to sink in the day of adversity because you have a buoyancy about you in Christ Jesus. That's what I want for you. To remain stable, steadfast, and full of hope is to have the buoyancy of Jesus in your life. And not only that, but that you would be the stability in the circles that you operate that you would be the stability in the family that you're in, that you'd be the stability in the community that you're in, and that you would be able to have the steadfastness that the rest of the world cannot because they did not have Jesus. I want your life to be a life filled with hope. Well, Matthew, that's great. How do I do it? How do I do it? I want to live 
stable, steadfast, and full of hope. I want that. That sounds wonderful. How do I do it? Well, I got four truths with you, for you, and this is where we're going to end. I got four truths and four responses to the truth, okay? And that's where we'll end today. Here's the first one. God is great. We don't have to be in control. When I say God is great, I mean in opposition to small. God is big. God is a big God. Can I tell you that control is overrated? Control is way overrated. And some of you in here are like, well, hold on, Matthew. I I like a little control. Control is overrated because we know that God is great. From the vastness of the universe to the intricacy of the human cell, God created all of that. He spoke it all into existence. He's moved mountains, calmed storms. He can bring to life what was once dead. Let me tell you, you don't have to be in control because you ain't got that kind of power. God is bigger than all the things that we're going through. God is bigger than our situations. God is bigger than the chaos in our life. You don't have to be in control. In fact, it'd be a lot better if you weren't. We get to trust God. That regardless of what comes, we may be able to be steadfast, stable, and full of hope because we know that no matter what, God is great. He is powerful and He is in control and He will not forget about us. And let me tell you this, that in your need for control, you may be robbing yourself of the peace that is found when we trust Him. In your need for control, you may be robbing yourself of the ability to relax into the peace of Jesus Christ. God is great. We don't have to be in control. Number two, God is glorious. We don't have to impress others. I have a church planning friend of mine down in the East Valley. One time he was at a football clinic. I'm not really sure how the story goes, but somehow he found himself playing basketball. In uh, I think I said football. I meant basketball. Uh, he got, found himself playing basketball in front of Michael Jordan. If you all don't know who Michael Jordan is, I don't know. Wake up. I don't know. <laughs> Arguably one of the greatest basketball players of all time. In my opinion, probably the greatest. Okay? But Michael Jordan went up to my buddy Trey and said, Trey, nice jump shot. Michael Jordan said he had a nice jump shot. So if I were to go up to my buddy Trey and say, bro, you have a trash jump shot, he would say, I don't care what you think. Michael Jordan said that I have a fantastic jump shot. Okay, this happened to me the other day at the gym. Y'all know I've been working out for a couple weeks now at the gym. I I got a good lift, some nice heavy weight. And somebody went, hey, nice lift. He was a jacked guy. It didn't matter if the coach came up to me and said, Matt, that was a weak lift. No, uh Dave said it was good. God the Father, because of Jesus, says that you are wholly blameless and above reproach. You are righteous, you are a child of God, and you don't need anybody else's approval. Your Heavenly Father loves you. He has brought you close to Him and says that you are holy and blameless, that you are His own. So let me free you of this. You can stop looking and needing approval from anybody else. Because God, who has all the glory, looked at you and said, you are mine. So no matter what the enemy tries to accuse you of, no matter what what shame he tries to throw at you, God has said something different. And like Michael Jordan saying that you have a nice jump shot, nobody else's opinion matters. You You can stop looking for approval from your dad, from your boss, from your pastor, or from anyone. God dictates who you are, and he says you are holy and blameless. Thirdly, God is good. We don't have to look elsewhere. We're all searching for the good life. And that's true. I know it is. I think I've told you, I have a buddy, Jimmy, and Jimmy and I love to sit on the tailgate of a truck and dream about what it'd be like to have 40 acres with a creek running through the middle of it, and you got, you know, a tire swing out there for the kids. And we talk about, we dream about this good life. And at the end of it, I like to go, Jimmy, but you know, if we had it, We'd want 50 acres. <laughs> We'd want something more. A bigger tire swing. We're all searching for the good life. life. And if you thought that the good life was going to be in your career, or when you had kids, or when you had money, or anything else in this world, I bet you're still looking for the good life. Because God is good. The source of goodness comes from God. To trust in God and live steadfast and stable, full of hope lives is living the good life. Because here's the thing, the things of this life will let you down. Your job will never satisfy you enough. Your kids won't fill that gaping hole that you have in your heart. Finding the right spouse isn't going to fulfill you. 
they're going to let you down. Trust me. I will. I let my wife down enough. Everything in this world will let you down. Money will let you down. The one thing that will not is God. But rather, when we recognize that God is the source of all goodness, we use the things of this world to fuel our worship for Him. That means my marriage, when there's something good in my life, that is the goodness of God being displayed in my marriage. When I see my little daughter fold her hands and play, pray, Dear Heavenly Father, please be with my mama and let her back feel better, that, that goodness is from God. When I see God at work in my job and my money and my power, that is just His goodness being displayed through the things of this earth. Those things of themselves are not good, but God's goodness is displayed through them. You don't have to search for the good life anymore because it's found in God. Then lastly, God is gracious. We don't have to prove ourselves. Here's the uncomfortable truth that I want you to really remember. You are sinful. You are absolutely broken, and you can, try to, you can stop trying to prove that you are not. Valley Life, what I want for you is I don't want you to be afraid of your sin. Totally be afraid to sin. You should totally avoid sin at the, as all you can, but once you have sinned, I don't want you to be afraid of it. I don't want you to feel like you have to hide it or conceal it. You don't have to hide that you have broken lives or that you are sinful. Because let me tell you, nothing good grows in the dark. Nothing. Have you ever put a planter or like a trampoline or something on the grass and left it there for a while? When you go to move it, it's been under that dark. What's underneath there? Just dead grass, worms, just nastiness. But once you remove it and let it be in the sun for a while, it takes what, one, two days? There's life in there again. Nothing good grows in the dark. Bring your sin, bring your brokenness to light, and you will find that Jesus has already paid for those. I told you earlier on in this sermon series that we will celebrate repentance, not moralism. Church, I'm not looking for you all to have perfect lives. I'm not looking for you to have it all together. What I'm looking for is, will you repent? When you find yourself in brokenness, when you're encountered with your sin, will you repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ? I want you to get really good at confessing and repenting. In our community groups every week, the last question that we ask is, what's the, what's the biggest thing you're going through right now? What's the hardest struggle in your life right now? Sometimes the answer is that my sin. We can confess that. I want you to get really good at confessing and repenting, not only to God. Get really good at confessing and repenting to each other. Get really good at it. The other day I left the dogs out. I'm notorious. I let the dogs out and I don't let them in. I forget about them. I'm sorry. They should have thumbs. They can open up their own door. Tracy was like, hey, you did it again. You left the dogs out. And I could have been like, no, I didn't. That had been dumb. She would have known it was me. No, even in the little things. Hey, baby, I did that. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to do that. Get really good at confessing and repenting, not only to God, but at least to God. Because the more that you can live broken, the more you can live to not hide your sin, the less broken you will feel. Can, can I say that again? The more broken that you, the more you live broken, the more you admit, gosh, I'm so broken, I'm so sinful, the more you live outwardly that way, the less broken you will feel. Because you will rest in the grace that you have in Jesus Christ. You will rest in the confidence of knowing I am who God says I am. And then you will be able to continue to live stable, steadfast, and full of hope because sin won't trip you up. Because you, when you sin, you can go, no, I repent, and I'm going to move on. You are not defined by your sin. You are defined by your grace. You are defined by your righteousness before God in Christ Jesus. So if I'm in Christ, how, if I'm a Christian, how should I see myself? In Christ. Because in that buoy of Jesus Christ, you are holy, blameless, and above reproach. You are loved, and you are forgiven. In light of that, we trust Him. We can be secure in Him, we can rest in Him, and we can give our brokenness to Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for Your grace, for Your goodness. God, that when I was alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, Father, You stepped in, and You reconciled in Your body of flesh to present me holy, blameless, and above reproach before You. Father, for the believers in the room, will you help them to just identify themselves as in you? That when 
they became a new creation. Father, they, that creation was nestled in you, that who you are is who we get to be before God. The Bible says that we are co-heirs with you like a brother. We get to sit at the table with you and our Heavenly Father, and we just get to be family like we belong. Help them to rest in that, to give up control, to give up getting praise from somewhere else, to, to just give up trying to act like we have it all together. God, that's not us. We are the ones who are broken, failures, but we're the ones who admitted it and turned to you. And Father, if there's anybody in the room who's not yet a believer, I pray that they would just admit, oh, I know I'm totally broken. I want to follow you. Will you forgive me, Father? I know that they will. I know that you will. And they can become holy, blameless, and above approach today. Father, as we go out, would you help us to be go out in you, in faith, a stable, steadfast, and full of hope, not shifting, because we're confident in you. Pray this all in your son's name. Amen.